Take your Bibles, please, and uh, turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, and this is page 762. Thank you, George. <laughs> page 762 in our blue Bibles. Nehemiah chapter 8. I'll speak from the whole of verses uh, 13 to 18. But to begin, we'll read uh, verses 13 to uh, 15. So, Nehemiah chapter 8, and beginning to read at verse 13. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the scribe to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites to live in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make booths, as it is written. Father God, we thank you for this account of Scripture, and uh, we thank you for this uh, account about uh, when you, uh, Lord, spoke through uh, your servant to Ezra and uh, reminded uh, your people about uh, your word and your command to celebrate the Thanksgiving harvest and to uh, uh, celebrate it by living in booths. And Father God, we uh, thank you for this uh, account and I pray that you will speak to us through it about, uh, Lord, uh, the Thanksgiving that uh, we uh, happily give you as uh, believers in Christ because uh, we have so much to be thankful uh, uh, for because of our great salvation and our great Savior, but also for your many practical provisions that we enjoy every day. And uh, so I pray that you will speak to us about thankfulness through this account. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. picture of uh, our Parliament Hill in, in Ottawa, the Canadian Parliament buildings. The North American tradition of Thanksgiving traces back to the European settlement of the eastern coastlands and the celebration of a day of Thanksgiving by Puritan Christians upon their arrival in the year 1619 at Plymouth in what is now Massachusetts. Following this uh, early English colonial tradition and other older European observances, Canadians have long celebrated Thanksgiving. Before Confederation in 1867, and for almost a century after, citizens of British North America and then Canada observed officially proclaimed days of thanksgiving for various reasons. In 1931, Parliament passed a proclamation that on October 15th, the nation should observe a holiday for general thanksgiving to Almighty God for the blessings with which people of Canada have been favored. Amen. Parliament continued to make this same proclamation yearly until 1957 when the government established Thanksgiving Day as a permanent observance on the second Monday in October, which is tomorrow, this year. Thanksgiving is a very Christian practice, and the long history of the tradition reaches back to the Bible, the Old Testament, and the commands of God to Israel. Here in Nehemiah chapter 8, we read about the fall harvest time Thanksgiving celebration, or the Feast of Tabernacles, 
by the returned Judean exiles. And the account urges you and me in Christ Jesus to celebrate the goodness of our Savior, Jesus, and to always live in happy thanksgiving, thankfulness toward him. Verse 13 recounts that on the second day of the seventh month of the year, the household fathers or heads of all the Judean families, along with the priests and the Levites, gather around the scribe or scholar Ezra to listen to him read from the Torah or the law of Moses. From verse 1 of chapter 8, we learn that the seventh month of the Jewish religious year has come, and the Judean people have gathered as one man in Jerusalem to hear the scribe Ezra read the Torah. Within the square of the water gate and from a high wooden platform, Ezra has read aloud the words of the sacred law. The priests and Levites standing among the people have explained to them the words that Ezra has read from the Hebrew Scriptures. And the men, the women, and all those who could understand the words from the Torah, they have listened attentively and carefully. So much so that in verse 9, the people have begun to weep and mourn because they understand how they have failed to keep the law. Verse 13 now recalls that on the second day, or the day after the assembly of all the people in Jerusalem, the heads of all the families, or the household fathers, who have remained in the city, have gathered again with the priests and Levites to hear the scribe Ezra read further from the Torah. After the first day, many of the families, including the young fathers, have returned to their towns and homes throughout the surrounding territory of Judea. They return to their homes, to their livestock, and to their olive trees and vineyards, which now in the seventh month, or our September, October, are ready for harvest. But the older family heads, the elders and leaders of the people, they remain in Jerusalem, along with the priests and the Levites, whose sacred vocation includes knowing and teaching the scriptural law of God. And listening to Ezra read from the Torah in verse 14, the Judean elders and priests learn that the Lord, or Yahweh God, has commanded through his spokesman Moses that the Israelites should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. The feast of the seventh month is the festival of tabernacles, which the law of Moses commands in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Hebrew word for the feast is Sukkot, which means booths, huts, or small tabernacles. And Leviticus chapter 23 commands the Israelites for the feast to take leafy branches and to make booths for themselves to live in during the seventh day celebration, a family camp out, if you will. Leviticus further explains that living for a week in leafy shelters will remind the Israelites that when Yahweh God has first redeemed his people and brought them from out from the land of Egypt, they have lived for 40 years in Sukkot, booths, tabernacles, or tents. Hearing this command about the feast of the seventh month and living for seven days in booths, the Judean elders and leaders understand in verse 15 that they should proclaim this word or this ordinance of Scripture throughout their Judean towns and in Jerusalem. The heads of the families and elders of the people should return to the towns that surround Jerusalem 
and sh should proclaim to their wives, their sons, and their daughters what the Judean leaders have learned they should do to rightly observe the Feast of Tabernacles. Go out into the hill country, the elders and priests of Israel, instruct their families and townsfolk, and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make booths. Leviticus commands the Israelites to gather palm fronds, leafy branches, and poplars. But the scholar Ezra and his fellow priests understand that branches from olive trees, myrtles, and other leafy trees serve to fulfill the scriptural command just as well. And so the elders of Judea urged their families and townspeople to celebrate the harvest time Feast of Tabernacles in the way Yahweh God has commanded in his written word. <clears throat> in verse 16, as they have been instructed from the law of Moses and by the elders of their families and towns, the people of Judea and Jerusalem go out to their orchards, to the hillsides and to the stream banks, wherever the trees grow, and they bring back to their houses leafy branches for building Sukkot, or booths. Many families build their shelters on the roofs of the open upper floors of their houses. The rooftops of Israelite dwellings have long been used for prayer, for outdoor celebration, and for evening relaxation. So the upper floors are well suited for seven day booth living. But some families raise their Sukkot within the outdoor courtyards of their U-shaped houses. Some priests build shelters within the courtyard of the newly built temple or house of God. And some Jerusalem dwellers put up booths in the open square near the water gate and the huts in the square by the Ephraim gate. Verse 17 recounts that the whole company of Israelite people who have returned from exile in the country of Babylon and have resettled in the land long known as Judah, all these lately redeemed people build Sukkot and live in them for seven days in the way the scriptural law commands the people of God to do. This is like a second exodus, a second great deliverance for Israel. And just as the Feast of Tabernacles and living in booths recalls the sojourn of Israel in the Sinai wilderness, now the redeemed Judeans also remember their exile in Babylon. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, verse 17 also recounts, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this. They have not built booths and lived in them for the seven days of tabernacles, since the days of the great conqueror Joshua, and since they have come out of the wilderness into the promised land. Certainly, the Israelites have celebrated the harvest time festival throughout their generations. And from Ezra chapter 3, verse 4, we know that the first group of Judean exiles returning from Babylon have observed the tabernacles festival within the first year of their return. But they have not celebrated it like the Judeans now celebrate it. Not with Sukkot, made from leafy branches, not with booths built on their rooftops, in their courtyards and within the city squares, and not reliving the tent dwelling days of the Israelites, a wilderness sojourn, until now, until this day, until this harvest season in Judah. And their joy was very great, verse 17 adds, because the Judeans celebrate tabernacles as God has commanded them, because they happily recall 
their second exodus and deliverance from Babylon. And because of the sheer enjoyment of children, mothers, and fathers living outdoors in leafy booths. Verse 18 concludes the tabernacle's account in the whole chapter 8 record about the reading of the scriptural law with a word about the obedience of the lately returned Judeans. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. These words clearly recall the Torah scriptures because Deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 9 to 13 explicitly command the people of Israel during the Feast of Tabernacles to read the law of God so they and their children will hear it and learn to obey Yahweh their God. And here now after their return from exile in Babylon, the Israelites are obeying the command of the Lord. Verse 18 here in Nehemiah 8 further recounts that the Judeans celebrate the feast for seven days as the scriptural Torah instructs. And on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation about the Feast of Tabernacles, the returned exiles hold an assembly. Both Leviticus and Numbers instruct Israel after the seventh day harvest feast to assemble on the eighth day and to make it a day of rest. So with their eighth day assembly, the returned Judeans are showing their devotion for doing the law of God. So how do you and I, who belong to Israel through Christ Jesus, fulfill the Mosaic command about the Feast of Tabernacles? By always living thankfully and like those who are truly and happily redeemed. But also by recalling what our Redeemer has done for us and the great salvation Jesus has made for us. How can we celebrate our bountiful provision without giving thanks for the greatest and richest gift of all? How can we recall our abundant earthly supply and not also remember our everlasting heavenly salvation? This is the reason the Apostle Paul in Colossians 1.12 urges grateful believers in Christ to always be joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Christians happily give thanks to the Father God for the everlasting salvation he has made for us through his Son, Christ Jesus. And this is just as the Israelites of the Old Covenant showed their gratitude to Yahweh their God by keeping his command to observe the yearly harvest time Feast of Tabernacles and by recalling his marvelous deliverance of them from slavery in Egypt. Not just the olive harvest, not just the precious and useful oil that comes from the ripened olives, not just the grape gathering, and not just the wine that gladdened the hearts of the Israelites, not just for these wholesome pleasures and happy provisions did the Israelites give thanks to the Lord God, but also for their historic deliverance from Egypt, and the provision from the heavenly I am for, for, for their ancestors while they wandered in the wilderness of Sinai. And so should you and I, likewise, remember to give thanks to Yahweh Jesus for the wondrous salvation he has made for us. 
by delivering us from our enslavement to sin and by leading us through the wilderness of this world to our everlasting heavenly inheritance. This is what we always give thanks to our heavenly Father and provider for. And certainly on the occasion of our Thanksgiving holiday, not just for the wine, not just for the oil, not just for the food and drink we enjoy in abundance, and not just for the other provisions and practical benefits we have so plentifully. The Judeans rebuilding Jerusalem listened carefully to what the law of the Lord their God commanded them about the Feast of Tabernacles and how they should rightly observe the sacred occasion. And they found written in the Hebrew Scriptures the commandment that during the Feast of the Seventh Month they should live in Sukkot, or leafy booths. And this was to remind them about their ancestors living in booths, or tents, when they came out of Egypt. And so should you and I, in Christ, remember where we have come from and what our Savior has brought us and our spiritual parents from. Remember the foolish ways and wasted days of our former lives. Remember the hardship and grief we endured before we began living the happy lives that Christ intends for us. And those of us who have grown up in the church in the way of Christian living, you and I should recall what our parents have been saved from and where we would sadly be if they had never found the Jesus way. Go out into the hill country, the Judean elders urge their family members and neighbors, and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make booths. And you and I ought to make booths also. Not leafy booths, although you may, if you like. And not with all of myrtle and palm branches, or even pine, spruce, and fir, for that matter. Rather, we should gather the boughs of our testimonies, thanksgivings, and praise, and we should make booths of remembrance, huts of recollecting what our Savior Jesus has done for you and me and for our families, shelters of recalling the many blessings our country of Canada has because of the Christian faith of our forefathers and mothers, and tabernacles of sincere thanksgiving to Christ our Lord. This is how you and I, in Christ Jesus, rightly and gratefully celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday. But we do not give thanks only once a year. And we do not observe the spirit and purpose of the tabernacle's command only at harvest time. Rather, we are always giving thanks to the Lord for all he has done for us. And we are always living and practicing gratitude. In the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 7, when a sinful woman lovingly anointed the feet of Jesus with perfume and wiped them with her hair, the master told the Pharisee who was looking on disapprovingly, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. She who had been forgiven much, loved much. And so it was with the returned Judean exiles. They loved much and gave themselves to the fulfillment of the law of God because they had been forgiven much and had been redeemed by the Lord from their captivity in Babylon. 
And so should it be for you and me. Have you and I not also been redeemed? Have we not also been forgiven much? Have we not returned to the better and more blessed way of living for Christ Jesus? And do we not also enjoy many provisions and benefits because of the Savior and the lives we live for him? So let us love like the much forgiven. Let us celebrate like the happily and everlastingly redeemed. And let us live like those who are truly thankful for all our mercifully heavenly Redeemer, Jesus, has done for us. What did the grateful Judeans do for the Tabernacles Festival? They went out into the countryside. They brought back leafy tree branches and they built booths on their rooftops, in their courtyards, and in the city squares. The Judeans did what the law instructed about the feast. At Thanksgiving time, you and I leave our homes. We bring the leafy boughs of gratitude and praise, and we build booths of remembrance here at church and by the assembly of ourselves in the name of our Savior. For seven days, the Judeans lived in the booths they had built for the feast, and they celebrated tabernacles in the way it had not been celebrating since the days of Joshua and the arrival of the Israelites in their land. And the joy of the thanksgiving Judeans was very great, it says. Similarly, you and I happily celebrate thanksgiving and honor our Savior and Provider, even though our neighbors no longer gather to give thanks, and they no longer observe the holiday like those who founded it. And we give thanks not just once a year for seven days only, but every seventh day and throughout the year. Day after day, from the first day to the last, like Ezra and the Judeans, the devoted followers of Jesus read from the book of heavenly revelation, from the Bible, from the Old Testament and the New, so that we may understand the will of God for our lives and be sure to fulfill it. And we do not do that, and we do this not begrudgingly, tiredly or legalistically, but gratefully, willingly, and happily. Because we ourselves have been redeemed, like the returned Judean exiles. And we ourselves have been forgiven much, like the sinful woman pouring out her love for Jesus. And like those who have been forgiven and redeemed, we follow the way of Christ and daily live by his instruction, lovingly and thankfully. The returned exiles celebrated the tabernacle's feast for the prescribed seven days. And then they assembled for an eighth day to further fulfill the Torah regulations. Likewise, for the redeemed of Christ, Another day of assembling in his name is no hardship. And an eighth day of rest and reverence for him is not tiresome. Rather, we enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday and we benefit from it. This year, 2023 in the state of Israel and for Jewish people around the world. The Thanksgiving Feast of Sukkot, Tabernacles or Booths, began the Friday before last on September 29th, at the time of the sunset. And it ended this past Friday, October 6th, at sunset. In Israel, the first two days of Sukkot are 
full-fledged, no-work-allowed holiday days. For the subsequent six days of the feast, work is allowed, but with restrictions. So for Jewish people in Israel, Sukkot, or Thanksgiving, is an important holiday and a week-long celebration. In preparation for the feast, Jewish families build a sukkah, the singular of sukkah, or a temporary shelter on their balconies or in their backyards. And throughout the week of the festival, the family will eat within the sukkah and maybe even sleep there for the nights. For Jewish people observing the biblical feast of sukkah, Thanksgiving is a time of happy celebration, but also a playful reminder of what the Lord their God has done for them. Similarly, you and I in Christ Jesus, for our Thanksgiving celebrations, take care to remind ourselves about his many practical provisions, but also about the everlasting salvation he has made for us. Praise the Lord. And so we have much to be thankful for. As I uh, speak about uh, Sukkot and tabernacles and the feast that the Jewish people have uh, lately uh, celebrated, uh, I'm reminded from the news that uh, it was on the eighth day, at the end of the eighth day, and uh, during the, uh, um, the uh, uh, Jewish Sabbath, when uh, the militant forces from Gaza attacked them. And so you can imagine when they were resting and finishing their celebrations, how unaware and unprepared they were for the attack, which makes it, uh, that much more uh, grievous and uh, sorry. And so we continue to pray for them. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, thank you for all your blessings and your provisions. We thank you for your word and for the example that it gives to us. We thank you for your commands about the festivals and feasts and about the great uh, fall Thanksgiving festival of tabernacles. We thank you for the faithfulness of the Jewish people, the Israelite people in uh, celebrating this feast in the past and uh, Lord being careful to uh, follow your word and to give thanks to you in the way that uh, you called them to do it and to uh, remember your great salvation for them. And so we uh, remember at this uh, Thanksgiving time uh, in here in Canada, uh, Lord, the great salvation that our Savior Jesus has made for us. We thank you for all your practical provisions, for the goodness that we enjoy because we live here. But we thank you most of all for our Savior Christ Jesus and the salvation he has made for us and the new ways of life that we live the happy ways of life and the beneficial ways of life that we enjoy because of our Savior and salvation in Christ Jesus. Father God, we uh, praise you and honor you and thank you and bless you for what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. And Father, again, I pray for the people of Israel. I pray your deliverance for them. I pray for the deliverance of the hostages and uh, I pray for uh, a return to a peaceful order in the land of Israel. And so I pray on this uh, Thanksgiving holiday, and I pray in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Go with thankful hearts and uh, don't eat too much turkey. <laughs> and have a blessed uh, week. God bless you.